Hi, I'm Ian Howell. I'm coming to you from the Voice and Sound Analysis Laboratory at the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston. This video is going to provide demonstrations of figures 6 and 7 from my article, Necessary Roughness in the Voice Pedagogy Classroom, the Special Psychoacoustics of the Singing Voice. This was published in the May-June 2017 edition of Voice Prints which is the Journal of the New York Singing Teachers Association. This video is not going to completely explain everything that is explained in the article. So if you have not read the article first, I would encourage you to um, go get a copy of it. It's available for free online. Uh, I'll put a link to uh, New York Singing Teachers Association's website. And uh, you can also search for it on academia.edu on my profile. Uh, looking really quickly at these two figures, this is figure six, which is a perceptually annotated power spectrum of a C5 sung by Franco Corelli. And uh, this is a perceptually annotated power spectrum of an A flat five sung by Gundula Janowitz. Um, now, I chose these two uh, pitch vowel combinations because they represent, for their respective voice types, um, challenging pitches to sing uh, in a well-registered manner. These are, you know, higher ranges for both of these voices, and um, it reaches the pitch range where you have to start making consequential choices with respect to uh, vocal tract tuning and intensity and sort of clarity of the vowel, what some people would call vowel modification or replacement or, you know, at least adjustment or migration. Um, so my goal with both of these figures is basically to take the exact same process with both of them and um, just investigate these sounds from a perceptual point of view. And um, following on what's written in the article, we're really just going to be looking at uh, three main perceptual divisions of the human voice. There's going to be the portion that sounds pure and resolved. There's going to be a portion that sounds rough and resolved and a portion that sounds progressively rougher and more unresolved. Um, then on to this, we're going to add one more perceptual characteristic, which is what I call absolute spectral tone color. So any given peak of the spectrum is going to have a quality of um, pitch resolution. It's going to have a quality of roughness. That is to say, it'll either be pure or it'll be rough. And it's also going to have an absolute spectral tone color uh, based on the frequencies of the harmonics that form each peak. So we'll just dive right into it. The first thing I'd like to do is just play you both of these samples so that you have them in your ear. This is um, a phrase sung by Franco Corelli from the aria A te o cara from Bellini's E Puritani. And that's going to be the C5 that we'll analyze. This is an excerpt from uh, Strauss's Beim Schlafengehen, which is one of his four last songs. This is sung by Miss Gundula Janowitz. And then that last high pitch is the A flat 5 that we'll look at. Now, if we look at figure six, look at this perceptually annotated power spectrum, um, we're going to divide this into uh, basically four regions that I, um, I would like to suggest have perceptually coherent qualities. Uh, so the very first one is, is literally just this first harmonic, which is a much lower amplitude than much of the remaining envelope. It's going to have a very pure quality. It's going to be resolved into the pitch. In fact, it is the only harmonic that Corelli has produced here um, that has a frequency directly equivalent to the pitch C5 that we perceive. And then if we look down at the absolute spectral tone color continuum, it's going to have an absolute spectral tone color that's, you know, it's mostly ooh. It's right on the borderline between ooh and o. Oh. And if we listen to it in isolation, see if you can listen for those qualities. Ooh, pure, resolved. Ooh. 
This next peak is made up of harmonics two, three, and four. And we'll see that these are going to be pure in quality. They are also going to be resolved into the pitch. You'll still hear the pitch C5. Um, the average tone color, the average absolute spectral tone color of these harmonics really falls right into the A, A range. Um, and so even though each one of these harmonics has a different absolute spectral tone color, we really hear the, the average one, the central one. This is a phenomenon that I call local spectral coherence, and I cover it in greater detail in my dissertation, Parsing the Spectral Envelope Toward a General Theory of Vocal Tone Color. You can find that on ProQuest and also on academia.edu. Uh, but for now, just think of you know, what is the, the sort of dominant absolute spectral tone color of this peak. I'm going to suggest it's A, it's going to have a pure quality, and it's going to be resolved into the pitch. Now, this next peak is made up of harmonics 5, 6, and 7. It has a resolved and rough quality, and it sounds mostly like an E. It has the characteristic absolute spectral tone color of an E. So listen for how that is rough. It has a buzzing quality. that is missing from these lower peaks. It's just a little quality of zzzz to that. Now, this fourth peak that I think is important for uh, perceiving Corelli's voice here is made up of harmonics from harmonic eight and higher. Now, we tend to not pay a lot of attention to this portion of the spectral envelope when we're considering singers, especially singers who have such a strong, characteristic, classically described singer's formant cluster, which is what harmonic five, six, and seven uh, is in Corelli's voice here. However, if we just look at this perceptually, what should these harmonics sound like? We'll notice that they fall into a rough, progressively more unresolved, so the higher they are in the series, the more and more unresolved they will be, and they have an absolute spectral tone color that has a bright E quality to it. So see if you can notice it just based on these characteristics. So it's an order of magnitude more zzz than these harmonics are. They're both rough, but this peak is rougher. And the higher we go in the series, I'll play it again and I'll just move the filter so we're listening to higher and higher harmonics, you'll um, eventually lose the pitch. If you just heard this sound in isolation, I don't know that you would be able to guess that this is part of a C5. Now, because this portion of the envelope is so strange, because uh, I think we're not encouraged to imagine that it could be particularly relevant to the sound of a voice, I'd like to delete it. So I'm going to delete it, we'll listen to the rest of the envelope, and then I'm going to fade it back in. And I just want you to notice that what I'm fading back in, uh, we can label it as bright E, rough, progressively unresolved into the pitch. Now, I hope that you'll agree that um, these harmonics add, they add something. They add, it's a qualitative difference. They are perceptually relevant to the sound of his voice. Whether or not they add something specific to the vowel or the comprehension of whatever word it is that he is 
uh, singing. So now what I'd like to do is just add these together one at a time. So I'll do it kind of jumbled and out of order to really try and tease these uh, differences out in your ear. So first we'll have ooh, pure, resolved, first harmonic. I'll add these high frequency harmonics. Ooh, and bright buzzy E. I'll add his A, ah. it will be pure resolved A. Ah. Now, even though that's incredibly high amplitude relative to the other two colors that we're hearing, it has not obliterated them. You can still hear the ooh, and you can still hear the buzzy, bright E. Same with the singer's form and cluster. It doesn't obliterate these other sounds. It just adds an E. And then finally, to put it all back together, I'll add the A. Now, I would like to suggest that in the Janowitz, there are basically three perceptually coherent regions. You will notice the shape, just the spectral slope of the Corelli, it has several peaks. And if we look at the Janowitz, really that does not exist. There's a smooth sloping off. There's a little peak around the 11th harmonic. But for the most part, it smoothly slopes. Because she is singing such a high pitch and because absolute spectral tone color is tied directly to frequency, these harmonics are more profoundly spread out over the same absolute spectral tone color range. So I would argue that these harmonics hold together in a first peak, which is constituted by first and second harmonics. These are going to sound pure, resolved, and for the most part like awe, just because the first harmonic is of such higher amplitude than the second harmonic. The second peak is going to be uh, made of harmonic three, four, and five. Now these are pure and resolved, and they sound mostly like E, almost into bright E sound. And it's really important to keep in mind that this was the absolute spectral tone color of Corelli's Singer's Formant cluster. So his E, like absolute spectral tone color, had a rough quality to it. In Janowitz, this is going to have a pure and resolved quality to it. And then as with Corelli, the, essentially the residual harmonics, the other harmonics higher in the series, have a rough and, in her case, less unresolved quality. These are more resolved into the pitch just by virtue of the fact that they are lower in her harmonic series by the time we get to the bright E absolute spectral tone color range. So these are rough, although they are not as rough as Corelli's, and they are bright E. Now, those of you who study um, acoustic registration, those of you who have come to understand how it is that um, we make uh, choices with our resonance tuning strategies, will recognize that this first harmonic is profoundly louder than the rest of her spectral envelope. This is a resonance tuning strategy that we call whoop or hoot. Um, now, just because it is so loud, we cannot ignore it. So I just want to show you what her voice sounds like when we remove that harmonic first. So this is the rest of her voice. We'll also hear orchestral okay. instruments bleed through without H1, and then I will fade that back in. As I fade it back in, we're going to add the main characteristic of the awe.
But just as with Corelli, just because one harmonic is profoundly louder than the remaining doesn't mean that the sound is being masked. Doesn't mean that that one harmonic causes us to not notice the qualities of the rest of the envelope. So I'd like to add these again one at a time, just so we hear them as separate entities. So we're going to have the awe first. We'll add the E qualities. So they have an A and an E. And then finally, we're going to add the very rough, bright E quality. Now, those of you who are skeptical of this high frequency energy, and I encourage skepticism because this is, I, I think it's a slightly new way of, of um, thinking about what defines the tone quality of the singing voice, not just what defines whether the singer is making a sound um, that can be understood as a specific uh, vowel color, as a specific word, um, but just actually what is the objective sound of the voice itself. Um, because when it comes down to it, I think the exciting potential of this type of targeted listening is that each one of those regions of the spectral envelope tells you something different about the way the singer's voice is functioning. So it helps feed into cultivating tonal models that tell us something about the use of the instrument itself. That will be more thoroughly unpacked in future videos and in future articles, but just so you know, it, for me, this is not um, something that is interesting but irrelevant. To me, this is something that is interesting and has informed just about everything that I do in the teaching studio. But if you are skeptical of this higher frequency energy, I would just like to point out one interesting thing, which is, this is the Janowitz. And if we go to the A-flat-5, this energy right here, these harmonics, are that zzz, zzz, very rough, borderline unresolved, bright E portion of the envelope. And um, you see that they have the exact same pattern of oscillation of vibrato as the, these harmonics down here do. And if we look at the Corelli, The same is true. This is the region of very high frequency energy above the singer's formant range. And you see that it has the exact same oscillation as the rest of his harmonics. So I don't necessarily think that an argument can be made that these are mere artifacts of the recording process or that these are sounds that were created uh, exclusively by orchestral instruments. Um, I think this is a sound that the human voice is objectively making. And if we label it in a manner that allows us to listen for it and pay attention to it, uh, then I think we have a higher chance of actually noticing that this is something that is taking place. If you have any questions about this, I would love to have a conversation with you about it. You can find my contact information on the website of the New England Conservatory of Music. Um, just find my faculty page. Um, thanks so much for taking the time to watch this video and uh, take care. Bye-bye.